Hello everyone and welcome to the UVic Hempology 101 lecture series. Um, my name is Brian Fink and I work at the Victoria Cannabis Buyers Clubs with Mr. Ted Smith, who is currently away uh, touring Eastern Canada to promote Hempology 101 and conducting a series of cannabis conventions at a couple of universities, Dalhousie and Mount Allison, as well as public libraries in Toronto and Ottawa. So I'll be uh, introducing today's guest, whose name is Mick Mann, or Opus. He's a licensed medical grower from Vancouver Island. Uh, he's proprietor of Opus Farms. He's a three-time candidate for the BC Marijuana Party and the Federal Marijuana Party. Um, he also is probably best known for his work on Pot TV, uh, which if you don't know is a web-based TV station that was started by Mark Emery some years ago to promote legalization and the herd in general. Uh, on Pot TV, it currently has about 56 videos, which are all up there to, to, to view, so I recommend checking those out. Notably, his uh, sort of cannabis magazine show, which is called Opus Live. So if you'll all please uh, give Mick a warm round of applause. He'll be speaking today on sort of his general take on medical marijuana in Canada to date and the, the general movement of the prohibition uh, cause. And thank you for all for showing up. And uh, yeah, well, uh, like Ryan was saying, I'm an original exempt 56, or an exemption 56. And uh, when the program started, it was because Terry Parker, uh, he won his case, his constitutional right to use uh, medical marijuana as medicine. And from there, the government, they appealed that. And this was at Supreme Court level. And the government lost that appeal. So in uh, layman's terms, they were dragged, kicking and screaming to the point where they were forced uh, to set up a medical marijuana program. And what they did was they came out with uh, an Exemption 56. And basically what that was, was it exempted you from Section 56 of the Criminal Code. And Section 56 of the Criminal Code at the time pertained to the, uh, the growing, the cultivation, and the possession and use of cannabis. So what they did at that point was, so I immediately went down to my doctor and did the research. I got the paperwork. It was a couple of pieces of paper. It was easy to get a hold of. Uh, my doctor signed the papers and sent them off. And then a little later, and I think it was about April 2001, I kind of forgot about it. Thinking, oh, you know, this will be, who knows? They'll say no. They're going to say no. Not realizing it wasn't up to them at that point that my doctor essentially was giving me permission and they just needed to cross the T's, dot the I's. Anyways, the paperwork showed up and it was, uh, it was a weird day, you know, like it was a bit like, I can't believe this, I'm, the, the weed that I'm already growing in my house is now legal. So uh, that was a pretty monumental time. And even the first few times I, you know, was around cops and they, oh, oh, do you see me smoking weed? It was like, wait a minute. I don't have to be worried. So there's, I started taking a very proactive, proactive stance. And again, at the same time, uh, this was around 01, uh, like I said, I started my first round in uh, provincial politics for the BC Marijuana Party in uh, the riding of Oak Bay Gordon Head here in Victoria. And uh, that was sort of a, a serious learning curve there. That was very good though, but it put me into the, the thick of uh, cannabis legalization and I sort of used that in, in, in conjunction with the medical marijuana with my being legal and allowed to you know, pursue that uh, endeavor. I'd like to point out that up until this point I'd already had 20 years of cannabis growing experience. So it wasn't like I was new to growing pot. Uh, so then the program came along is 01, and it went through a lot of different changes. There was many court challenges. Um, also during this time, the Vancouver Island Compassion Society, it had uh, been 
raided and there was a constitutional challenge going through the courts at that time as well. And at which point the outcome of that was that the judge pretty much commended the Vicks for the work they had done and said that, you know, could see that there was fault in the, in the program and that there was a need for people to get supplied medical marijuana. They needed their meds. Uh, also along this time there were various different busts and such at the Cannabis Buyers Club, Ted's Club. And I'm sure you've heard him speak uh, at length about those. So, you know, you would know more about that than I do. <laughs> I was in one of them. You were in one. There you go. So pe people directly related are here so, to those events. Now, one of the things that came up, and this is interesting, that through many of the court cases against Health Canada during the inception of this program, well, let me actually back up. Um, after a while of having the Exemption 56 program, the government decided to make it a little bit more difficult because too many people were applying and they didn't like that. So they came out with what became the MMAR or the Medical Marijuana Access Regulations. And these were very erroneous regulations that uh, they put it down they categorized various illnesses, category one, two, or three, whether you were uh, terminally ill with less than a year to live, category two with some other illnesses. So some of the court cases that, that sprung up out of this, uh, one of them were challenging that, the right for the government to categorize the severity of illnesses or something to that degree. It was a little more technical than that. I don't know if my law exactly. Um, that was one of the court challenges, and they eventually did away with the categorization, so that changed. Um, I'd like to note, though, that every time that these court cases, every one that I'm going to mention, that the government used the entire length of time afforded to them, usually a year, to make the changes. Well, they waited till like, zero hour to make those changes. It didn't need to take that long, but they constantly dragged their feet behind this. And the reason I bring that up is because it will show that we've gotten to a point now that it shows a pattern of unwillingness to make a workable program. The government's never done anything to support patients' rights and the rights afforded to us by the courts. So I, you know, on that I think I would hope somebody one day would have deep pockets and sue the living shit out of the government for it. At least take them to task, make them defend that. So. On we go, uh, another court case that was brought uh, up against the government was the, uh, the responder there had a restriction that only, you could only grow for one license in one location. So regardless if I had a room as big as this auditorium and if I'm only using a quarter of it, I couldn't say, gee, you know, you have a license, you could set up your 50 plants or 25 plants over in that corner, or maybe I could get someone else to put theirs there, and we could all share the expenses. That wasn't allowed. So there was another case regarding that. Now, uh, again, the government took a year to make the changes necessary, and when, and order, as ordered by the court, and when they finally made those changes, they increased it from one to two. And this was, if you look at the transcripts of the trial and how things progressed, this was clearly not the intention of the court when they made that decision. They wanted to see it made more workable. Four or five would have been much more reasonable and it showed that the government was being a little bit more workable and understanding in some of the trials and tribulations it takes to be a successful cannabis grower. Because it is a lot of work. Um, the Hitsink decision was another one, and for the life of me, I can't remember exactly what that pertained to. Well, I believe that was plant numbers or counts. I know things have changed considerably from the start. Like, originally, my, I was, my doctor had signed for five grams of pot per day on the forms, which gave, and they originally, my uh, plant limit was seven plants way back in 2001, seven plants. But uh, very quickly we lost that. So, do you have something you want to question? Well, no, I'm just saying, Mike, 
I believe because mine says three grams a day, but it gives me 15 plants. Well, that's under the MMAR. Mm -hmm. That's right. So this I'm going back. This was from an exemption 56, my very first one, seven plants. Yeah. And uh, I forget the amount I was allowed in storage. It wasn't much. See, now that I'm at uh, seven uh, grams per day, I can have uh, 35 plants and three pounds in storage. And uh, but it's taken almost 12 years to get to that point. And uh, many, many court cases. Now, one of the most interesting cases that's still before the courts, we're waiting on a decision from the, actually the government's appeal, we're waiting on the decision now, is the, uh, the Murnau case, Matt Murnau in Toronto. Now, he never did have an exemption of any kind, neither, neither an MMAR card nor an exemption 56. And he was arrested for growing pot spent some time in jail, and him and his lawyer, Paul Lewin, uh, they went to court, and there was a constitutional challenge, and like so many other people that across Canada, they can't find a doctor to sign their paperwork. It seems to be the number one question in this in this whole program is people are always asking me, he says, do you know a doctor who will sign my papers? And, you know, or is there a list? or somewhere I can go online. And it's like, no, nothing like that exists. Um, you know, you need to find a doctor taking new patients and then you need to uh, ask those doctors. I recommend that people, when they look for a doctor, is they actually interview doctors. I recommend that people actually call up doctors, you know, get a list. It's not hard to find out a list of uh, doctors that are taking new patients. That's easy to get. And then call every single one of them on the list, One, you know, make a couple appointments a week. And when they say what for, Tell them, you're interviewing doctors. Say, I'm interviewing doctors. I need a new doctor. I'm looking for a doctor. I don't have a doctor. I need a doctor. Oh, and then, because uh, when I did that, when I went doctor shopping, and I was very well received everywhere I went. As a matter of fact, I was commended everywhere. Nobody saw that as a waste. I was wasting anyone's time. As a matter of fact, they wished, many doctors told me they wished more people did that. Because, for instance, if you're like on assistance, say you got government assistance of some type, and you need forms filled out. I went to see one doctor, and she told me straight up, one of the things she goes is, well, I don't like doing paperwork. I said, well, you're not gonna be any good to me because I'm all about paperwork. <laughs> so I mean, but that was just, you know, oh, well, thanks a lot, I appreciate it, and we were both happier for that rather than sign up and argue with this person for God knows how long and do something that she hates. So, you know, I, I really recommend that people start doing that when they look around at doctors. That's the, the, the hardest part. And uh, be open with your doctor. It's like two people you should never, you know, lie to. As a matter of fact, and always tell them everything. Is your doctor and your lawyer. You know, because that's how they can help you best at all times. You know, that really is the best way. Uh, so yeah, the Murdoch case, he got busted uh, with plants, spent some time in jail. They con we brought up the constitutional challenge and the justices, the you know, Ontario Supreme Court, sided with Murdoch and gave the government a year to fix the program. And the, and the program is because the, they gotta make it easier where doctors can sign. Unfortunately, hi, come on in. So what's happening now is that in the Murdoch case is that uh, the government appealed and went back and asked for more time. Now one of the interesting things in, in court in an appeal is you're not allowed to present new evidence. You can only go back over what's already been presented and try to get caught and, you know, and show, look at it in a different light. Now, interesting enough, I was there for the appeal. This was back in May in Toronto, and I happened to be in Toronto at the time covering the Global Marijuana March for Pot TV. So we went to the Murnock Court as well, and uh, it was really interesting because as soon as the Crown Prosecutor said about a paragraph of words, one of the justices said, look, you can stop you right here. If that's the premise of your appeal, you might as well get out of here right now because we'll be back here in six months and I don't, you know, that he was not going to have any of it. Like, they were just cutting their own throats. It was amazing. So, 
we're at, I think, going into six months, which is unusual, waiting for the uh, justice's decision on the Murnau case. But it is that they've ruled the way it is now uh, unconstitutional. The MMAR is unconstitutional. And, um, if they rule in our favor, well, this could be, marijuana would be legal for everybody. So this is really a huge, um, a, a, a big case that a lot of us are following rather closely. Um, Matt Murnau is also a POT TV guy. He's on Tuesdays. You can watch him on POT TV as well. We've done quite a few shows together. Uh, he's a lot of fun to work with. He's a character himself. So uh, that's a brief history of the MMAR and sort of where we stand today. Some of the proposed changes, uh, now this is interesting as well. The government is at the point where they proposed changes and what basically they started at is they want to get out of this business altogether now. They're talking about turning it over to the private sector. Uh, they're looking at it that there would be large uh, independent private groves and that it would just happen that your doctor would sign some papers, you would contact one of the approved large groves, I guess through uh, compute mail, email, or, or through the post. And then what happens is that you, uh, they would send you your, you pay them directly and they would send you weed. You want a question? Are they still irradiating, are still irradiating the pot? The government pot? Yeah. Yes. The stuff that you get from the government. The the so those the, be the people that they'd be regulating. The PPS weed. What they want them to do to it, right? Well, I'm not sure on the contract on it because I didn't read the new contract requirements for these grows, and I don't think that would be irradiated. I'm not sure on that one. Uh, there, there is a, a couple of big problems. These are well. First of all, the biggest problem I see with the proposed changes is the government wants to remove the right for us to grow our own. For us, yeah, exactly. Now, one of the interesting uh, things about this is that, first of all, the private sector is not going to get in it. Like, nobody in the private sector is going to grow pot unless they can make money at it. The private sector doesn't do anything for free at all. They have to, there's got to be profit. I personally don't see how, under the present program, that they can produce pot any less than $5 a gram. So to cover their expenses and make a little money, you're looking at the same price as black market prices, or today's prices of $10 a gram. Now, for what I know a lot of people, like myself, it's seven per prescription of seven grams a day. Or say, I want a quarter pound a month. Who's gonna pay for it? So unless that becomes covered uh, by some sort of insurance, or because like really most people who are in this program are on some kind of disability pension of some sorts. They, there's not that many people with like big fat, high paying jobs that are on the, in the MMAR, very few. You know, I don't believe there's that many. Most people are on some kind of disability. I know, it's like my care card for all the other drugs they give me. Exactly, you sign, you sign here, right? So I see a lot of problems, A, the public not wanting to pay for it, so the government's, you know, they got to deal with that. And if we can't afford it, well, there's impediment to access. And we've already gone through court on that. This is part of that whole reason why we can grow our own weed and stuff through these cases. There has to be a, it's the whole access. And again, with the Murnau case, it's not having doctors sign, being able to find a doctor to sign your paperwork is impediment to access to the weed you're entitled to. So, so if you want dope, you have to go through a doctor, so they get a cut then too, right? Because every time we go see a doctor for two seconds at the walk-in clinic, the government pays them, what, 25 or 45 bucks for five seconds. And then in the ER units, if you see a doctor there, the government pays them 75 bucks. So it seems like the doctors want a cut of the act. Well, you have to see a doctor to get your permit. That, 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 to get a permit? To get your MMAR card, to become, to actually get a legal permit so that you could legally grow weed, you need an MMAR, uh, are there a designated grower's license that you're growing for someone else, or you need to have a personal production license, PPL. 
which is you know uh, exactly that, producing for yourself. Those are the only two ways to grow wheat right now legally in Canada. Yeah. Okay, and that you get through Health Canada. And to get one of those, I, well, designated grower, you would work with somebody else who's in the program or, like I say, or if you want to get a license for your own personal use and possession and, uh, and cultivation, then you need an MMAR uh, card. Yeah, because I, I spoke with a sociologist back in the early 90s, and he was growing, he was the one that was growing pot for the government, and it was an experiment, he said. They had huge fields of marijuana that they were growing. Yeah. This guy was based out of, uh, he was friends with a guy named Dave Martin, who's no longer a sociologist, but uh, they were in Thunder Bay, Ontario, of all places. But like, uh, I, I work with doctors indirectly, and what I've learned is that the Hippocratic Oath versus the, um, uh, there's another guy named Esophagus, I think his name was, and he wanted medicine to not be for profit, but just to help people. And Hippocrates didn't want to help people unless he got cut from it. Yeah, well doctors don't actually take that oath anymore. I don't know if you're aware of that. They don't take the Hippocratic oath anymore? No. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. It's old fashioned, man. Like things, a lot of things aren't done anymore. Like we, unfortunately, a lot of people assume a lot of stuff. And I, I, I had the exact same reaction. I went, what? Wow. But I found that out too. It was only a couple years ago I learned that. I was like, really? I have no idea. Oh no, they don't do that anymore. It's on the, probably on their diploma or something, right? But it's not like they all stand up and do it. Okay. They just, they streamlined a lot of that kind of stuff. And because of, people were finding it old and boring. So yeah, but why do we need a doctor though? I mean, if I want to get high, why do I need a doctor? You know well, I mean? you don't need a doctor if you want to get high. But if you want to cultivate cannabis and smoke it in front of a cop legally and be able to walk around with, and like me and go through security at the airport and get on a plane with a half a pound, you better have a permit. <laughs> That's just the way it is. And I, and I, like I say, I was in Toronto three times this year and I walked through security three times, well, six times, back and forth. Sure. And only once this whole year did I get stopped by the, and have to deal with cops. And I had a big freaking half pound tub, Tupperware tub in my knapsack. I got pretty much all I had in the rolling machine. Yeah. It's because well, I'm not checking it under, under the thing because it'll go missing, right? And like Health Canada says on my permit that I have to be responsible for the safekeeping of my medicine. Sure. So it's like, well, I'll just hold on to that. <laughs> and, you know, you walk around like you own the place, people won't usually question you. The so the what kind of card do you carry? I have an MMAR card. As I said earlier, I started off, I was telling people, um, originally when this program came into effect, it, it, there was an exemption 56. And what that was, was an ex exemption to section 56, the criminal code, pertaining to the, the use, possession, and cultivation of cannabis. So when Terry Parker won the right, to use medical marijuana and they decided that it was your constitutional right that the government couldn't prohibit the use of cannabis as for medicine, for medicinal use, they had to come up with something. So they gave an exemption to that section of the, of the code. So the police would say, well, we're not going to proceed in court because you're exempt. They've never actually, now it's nice to note that the government's never recognized yet that cannabis is an effective medicine for treating anything. They still tell you that it's experimental and that we're not sure and then they and then they turn around and then on the next paragraph try to tell you about recommended dosages which is like uh, no more than three grams a day they're trying to keep everything at three grams a day nice to know where did they get that three grams a day number from exactly. from the DEA the very same people who say the cannabis has no medicinal value whatsoever but somehow come up with a three gram per day limit for medical use. How did they how did they get into that? That doesn't make sense. If you say it has no medical value, why would you recommend if you, oh, but if you're going to use it for medicine, three grams a day? Yeah, that's what Well, the whole the whole war on drugs and the whole idea of prohibition of cannabis itself is ridiculous, especially cannabis. That's really bad. Um, well, I say if they legalize it, violence is going to go way down with regards to the trafficking of it. It's going to solve a lot of border, border issues. And uh, I love what Amsterdam has done. They have totally acknowledged uh, that issue. And apparently, uh, it's, it's not out of control. And 
and uh, people are actually quite responsible about it. And uh, well, there's a sociologist named Dr. Ruperetz who is now deceased, but he he was saying that actually alcoholism is what the killer is. Because the alcohol just smashes the living pieces out of the liver. Yeah, well, alcohol is, you know, another is probably a very dangerous drug. I mean, when you look at as drugs go, where I think uh, marijuana could be more associated with uh, coffee. Yeah. Just a picture, guys. Yeah. Um, all right, well, so I was talking about the privatization of, of the pot and where this is going to go. Now, the government by uh, getting out of it altogether, they also said that they were not going to, in their proposals, because I have all the people who are in this program now, which is over 10,000 Canadians the last time I checked, uh, are, are legally involved in somehow in the pot industry, in medical pot. So what's happening is that uh, they weren't even going to issue any type of car or permit. So now it's like, well, wait a minute. If I just go to my doctor and he gives me a paper and I just deal with this company and they send me their pod, first of all, saying that I can afford it, and secondly, that it's uh, the quality that I'm expecting, which has got to be better than what I can do. Good luck to them. I got 36 years of experience. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, providing those two things, now, cop comes along. I don't even have any proof to show him that I am legally allowed to have that because the government's no longer issuing me any kind of car or permit because they're getting out of it altogether. But what it really is, the government, the reason they want to get out of this is because as I was talking about all these court cases that have gone on over the last 12 years, and like we're waiting now on the Murnau case, that it's every time the government is getting beat up in court, we kick their asses. Every decision, the government, the, the, the judges look at the government like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Why are we even here? The, government, the, the courts can't believe that we keep going back to court for medical pot with the government. They're, you should hear the justices. Go sit in on one of these cases. And you look at the faces of the guys sitting up on the bench and it's like, well, I wouldn't want to be the crowd. I wouldn't want to be the government lawyer in this. Because they're pissed. You could clearly see it. Read the transcripts, it's funny. It's almost like, wait a minute, this is not supposed to be emotional. Well, I know that other drugs, like morphine, and I knew that was happening with oxycontins and a few other things, people were dying. Oh yeah, well, no, no, of course. Like, First of all, nobody's ever died in the history of, of recorded history from pot. The only people who've died from pot have died from pot prohibition. But nobody's ever died from, you can't smoke enough pot. The, the lethal dose of pot, you'd have to smoke I, like 30 pounds in 15 minutes. I think that's, they figured it out. And then you're not dying from the pot. You're dying from lack of oxygen. <laughs> and that's not the pot. I mean, you can eat enough pot to get really fucking sick. But you won't die. It's really hard to get, you, unless you've got some kind of weird metabolism thing and you got some kind of odd reaction, but like, it's never happened. Not in recorded history, or believe me, the prohibitionists would be holding that up every time. This guy died! But they don't do it because it's never happened. And believe me, they wish they could. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. Right. Sorry, I thought I started hanging. Oh, no, sorry. I, was, I think it was... You have a question, yes. Um, so you were speaking earlier about the cost of cannabis being prohibitive uh, for, for patients who need to acquire it, given that they're often in low-income situations. Well, produced on the private by the private sector, yeah. I would assume it would be cost prohibitive, because just at the cost to produce it, they're, they got to make a profit. Right. But no. say, you've got a, say you've got an industrial-scale grow-off, uh, well, how is that going to affect the price of cannabis? I do think it remains stable because if the larger operations, if you have a five acre greenhouse and 10, 15 people or whatever working and, and much of it automated, the quality is not the same as if a guy who's got 50 plants or 150 plants or 200 plants, uh, depending on the method of growing. If they're growing a hydroponic, like 
500 plants and a couple of uh, flood tables, right? So it sounds like a lot, but they're small and it, you know, but it does give you that sea of green. Or if you're growing in soil, or a guy who's even got a field, like a half acre of the back. You can put a lot more care and attention as a grower, I know this, you're gonna have a higher quality. So again, it'll all come down to the quality. And it's no different like in, in wine or in a good cigar. People will, there's people out there, they'll pay hundreds of dollars for a bottle of wine. They'll pay, you know, $80 for a cigar. And the same will happen with cannabis. And it always will be that way with cannabis. There'll be people who will want to have that best stuff. So yeah, the, the price will fluctuate. Though. And I think what we need is you'll see different grades. The way it should be, it should be graded down. Uh, we need the weed board, never mind the weed board. Um, and people like myself who know what's going on, and people who work at the, at the clubs right now and do this job already, grade the weed and check it for mold and make sure it's quality and, and all the things that are done. These are the people who should be running these operations where if I myself say, I want to grow commercially, okay, I get a permit from the government, I pay my dues, they've inspected my place for a safety, away I go. I can take that weed to a certain place where it's graded and I'm giving a price that's set. And then that can go out to clubs or to cafes that sell weed where you can go and have coffee and smoke. Amsterdam style cafes. What I notice is that uh, they send you a, a, a list of, uh, kind of like a catalog list of seeds, right? That you can get from them if you want to grow yourself. But they're not telling you much about those seeds. They give you a bunch of variety of prices, but not a variety of grades. They're not telling you much about the strains, you know? No, they, they, they've never made this a workable program. One of the reasons they haven't made it a workable program, especially uh, from the beginning, was they wanted to make this the biggest uh, problematic issue possible, and then they could come back later and say, oh look, see, pot doesn't work. And they were hoping that was the original plan, and then they could be done with it. Created to Why do they want pot to work? Well, it's not that they don't want it to work. They know it works. They just, they don't want to have it out there because there's a lot of people out there with a lot of money that don't want to see the competition. They have, they would lose money. The pharmaceutical industry. Um, an article in Forbes that I read, and there was another one online as well, uh, another financial publication, that said that if pot was to be mainstream right now in, in America, none of my Canada, this was just in the United States, and I mean like per, you know, commercials on television like they do for all those other drugs. Except for you wouldn't have all that warning part. It'd be like warning may cause drowsiness, the munchies, you know, instead of anal bleeding and ulcers and shit like that. You know, the side effects would actually be kind of fun. Laughter and But yeah, laughter and shit, exactly. They want to watch movies and play video games. And munchies, yeah. But, uh, but aside from that, they say it would only take it would only take a sixth, one sixth of the pharmaceutical business. But yet this, these pharmaceutical people fight tooth and nail because they don't want to lose one sixth of their business to what they consider. And now what we're talking about are uh, well, <laughs> organic or uh, natural medicines. That's, you know. It's natural medicines, which is why even today, the, there's laws in Canada, like every single day there's at least one or two natural herbs of some kind that all of a sudden become banned. And you can look that up, it's, it's, a, it's a fact. Every day, something is being banned off the natural products list or restricted. Um, I know if you've been to the health food store lately and looked at some of your things, you've gone, hey, this is kind of all changed. What's, Oh, they've had to change the labeling because everything needs a number, a DIN number now, which is called a drug identification number, a DIN number on the side. They've had to do this with all natural products and they all need to be retested and classified if they don't meet certain purity standards and so things are disappearing all the time because, and it's, who do you think's funding all that shit? The pharmaceutical industry. Because it's competition, people are throwing away the pills, they're going and saying, you know what, I'm going to start going back to what natural remedies, what's worked, and they feel better. You know, they, the side effects from drugs that people are on for, you know, blood pressure, they don't... So that's what's going on, and, and partly due to the internet, partly due to all the hard work of activists, and the message is getting out there. And the fact, you know, when you tell the truth, your story never changes. 
the prohibitionists are always coming back with new crap. They always got to come up and throw stuff in. There was the issue about the, the laced weed with glass. And then there's other guys in the States talking about meth in weed. Who wants to, who would cut Scare a, 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 a lesser product with a more expensive product? Yeah. Doesn't make sense. The only reason you'd cut weed with meth is if you want to get people hooked on meth. Question. And, and that makes a good point for legalizing it because some of those black market groups that do do things like that to get people hooked on those harder drugs need to have this product taken away from them so they can't use it like that. People are more likely to get it through a legal source than an illegal source, you know, if they could be more assured that it wasn't going to be laced with something like that. You know? Well, yeah, and I mean, one of the things now is I like to ask people when they're opposed, you know, people in my age group, I they go, well, you know, I'm not so sure if we should legalize. And I said, well, right now, you know, like a lot of my friends, I'll go, where do you get your weed? And they say, well, I get it from my kids. <laughs> I said, you know, really, your teenage kids, you get your weed? Yeah, that's where I get my weed from. Or I get it from one of my kids' friends. Yeah. And it's all cool, you know, well, oh, yeah, right on. Yeah. And then I'll say, like, uh, and they'll go, oh, it's not as good as your weed. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. So I said, you seem to think, I says, let me ask you, would you be cool if I asked you, if I said, where do you get your boobs? You get that from kids? Your boobs? You get that from your kids' friends? Would that be, oh, no, that doesn't sound good, does it? Or ask them, I said, where do you get your other drugs? Like, where do you get your pills from? You think you get those from your, you know, All of a sudden, it's not good. So why is it okay that you get your weed from kids? <laughs> because right now, if you're opposed to legalization, or if you're opposed to, to, you know, having regulations, well, I look at it right now, so the kids are the ones who are in charge. They're the ones who have the weed. I said, you don't, you don't, people don't go up, you don't get your booze from the kids, so if we legalize it, we would all get our weed from the same place or a place like where we get our booze. Regulated, controlled, you know what you're getting every time. And, you'd be, and it'd be a tax collected that goes back into the economy. Right now, geez, I can't even, the money taken out of the economy, every weed sale, that's money that's not being taxed. Well, what I don't like is the amount of money that we spend um, that's weed related tied up the course, which is like something like four grand a minute or something. I don't well, know. Well, enforcement it. costs, absolutely. All the enforcement costs, well, whether it's courts, it, sheriffs, it transportation, to and from court, video calls. I mean, lawyers, fees, all crap. that stuff. Absolutely. absolutely. The enforcement costs. The sa there's, see, there's an automatic savings. You can never forget about tax. And like this is interesting because in Colorado and Washington that recently just legalized, they're talking about big tax revenue. But I don't think they're going to get it because unfortunately they set a price of like 10, 12 bucks a gram. Once they set, well that's the same price as the black market. Okay, question. Who's going to produce all this weed? If you get big tobacco companies doing mass production and it's mediocre pot, which it will be, you know, and what happens if they have a shitty year or a big storm comes through and wipes out the weed crop? Who's going to sell you the weed then? Oh, there was a flood. There was oh, we had a bad year. There was locusts. They'll just have to go through their. So own what happens then? So you see that won't work very well. What do we got that works? We've got a system in place now for seven, for almost 90 years. People growing and selling weed, and we have we've gone about our own business. You can't stop us. I've been, we've all been, sorry, you have a question? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, sorry. so I just caught up the corner of my eye. Sorry, I'm um, So, you know, these, again, that's not going to change. People have been growing weed for years and years and years. All of a sudden it's legal. I'm like, well, I already kind of grow weed and I've already got my customer base and I'm already, you know, I've been doing this for years and years and years. Why the hell do I want to join? You're going to charge me what? I don't think so. There's going to have to be other incentives. So, but this is good though, because legalization is still good because they've taken a first step. But they're going to have to work out all that stuff. They haven't really thought that through <coughs> clearly. But that's okay, because you start one place and go from there. And they did the right thing. Legalized. Now they can work on the regulations, and the regulations can be changed. You know, like drinking ages it goes up, goes down. Voting ages. You know, like. Regulations on driving, you know, now you have to have those little stickers on the back, you know, your, your different graduated licensing. So those are like regulations can always be suited and changed and worked on, you know, and that's why activism, once pot's legal, we'll still have lots of work to do because it's not going to be a perfect scenario. It never is. Um, like with Colorado and Washington, yes. uh, the 
the state laws change, but I heard that the federal law is still like against it, so the DA can just come whenever and shut everything down. Well, that's interesting. That's a good point. Um, Colorado did one thing more though. They changed the state's constitution. Um, so the federal government won't be able to just come into Colorado. They have to take the whole state to court. And they did that on purpose. They, they did their homework and they really knew what they were doing. And kudos to those guys. Because there's already a lot of content with many states. The states want more control over lots of stuff. Fish and game, this and that, where the feds, you know, they're at odds with federal government. Even the, their whole Republican Party was, their part of their campaign was less government. Like if Republicans, can, Republicans get in, they let the states do what they want, except pot, of course. But they, uh, they do a lot of it. So um, that, that's one thing. Washington, they'll be able, sure, they can go in. But unfortunately, you've got five other states now that are, are introducing bills to legalize as well. Maine, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, um, Ohio may go in there, and then there's one, and there's one other one in there too. Um, Connecticut, I think. But they're like, they're lining up. Um, and countries around the world, like in Jamaica, there was the, one of the ministers in the Jamaican government's up there saying that the U.S. no longer holds the moral authority to tell any other countries what they can and cannot do as far as legalizing pot. And they don't. Because clearly, I mean, more people in Colorado voted for the legalization of marijuana than voted for the either of the two president choices combined. That's a lot of votes. I had, I heard the number was up, I saw it on Facebook. It was the total number of votes for pot, total number of votes for both of them, for everybody else. More people voted for pot. So. There's such violence associated with it. I mean, you got the submarines, that they're packed from Mexico, Latin America. There's people being killed, I mean. Costa Rica. I personally don't smoke pot, but I have Costa Rica police. Who, and all the time you're seeing war on yep. drugs, this, war on drugs, that federal government bringing black hawks, bringing, uh, uh, what do they call them, Galaxy 5 Globemasters, huge jets at something like operating costs of $15,000. Billions and billions of dollars and are spent. Why not, if we legalize that, then all of that's out of the equation. But you know what I think? I think the arms dealers are the ones that are profiting from all this shit. Well, they, of course, first of all, the United States, the United States is... And I think if you cut it out, I think people would be a lot more peaceful about it. Well, you got to remember, the United States is the largest arms dealer in the world. So it's not good business to promote peace. All right? That's for starters. You know, when, and whether it's, you know, war is war. Drug war is no different than... Any other war, they're using the same equipment. They fly, like you say, those planes and those the helicopters. Like 10 million bucks. They, the planes you know, are like 150. This is well, and you got to, and, and this is a big part of it. There's the business of prohibition. You know, there is a full-time business of prohibition. You, they have fairs. You can go to like a, you know, a, a show, an expo, and all it's full of is cop stuff. New tasers, new handcuffs, new all the bells and whistles and all this stuff and they say oh we can combat the drug war forward-looking infrared radar or FLUR as it's called was originally developed to look in, into homes to see if you had heat loss so you could tell if you how well insulated your house was that immediately got used for police now they shine into your house to see if you're growing pot because a thousand watt bulb looks like a sun inside the house in your basement and they know right away oh you know, you, it's very difficult to shield from that. And it, so it's just that people, you know, the technology's come out, somebody's out there working full time, how can we use that to make a cop toy? Yeah. And it's, it, you know, to militarize the technology is what it is, right? So, I mean, there's no shortage of that. So this is, we're not, like again, you know, it's the pharmaceutical industry, I see there's, the, there's, the, there's the, the police unions, very strong unions. They don't want to say because it, it could lay off man hours and extra brownie points for doing easy work. It's easy pickings, picking down uh, weed people. That's easy work, and it's like those are just brownie points on your uh, on your resume as a cop. Like look at Heckler. That's not real police work. I mean, the German manufacturer of most of the MP5s, MP6s, the PSG1s. You see all those, uh, and as soon as they decide that they're going to declare a war on drugs, what do they do? They have battalions 
You know, they show you a picture of over a hundred people. Each one of those weapons is something like a thousand to three thousand bucks a piece. So they're carrying a, at least a quarter of a million dollars just in weapons, not including bullets, not including everything else that they're carrying. And you know, and then you have the Huey's helicopters that they're selling to the Mexicans and the, uh, the Colombians and the South, um, the people that are down in Latin America. And then you have, like, I saw the documentary about um, the the Globemasters. I mean, the Globemasters can lift a, a heavy lift aircraft that can lift a small village from one place to another. Man. And the Americans were sending fleets them down there. All right, can I, can I just? Me all right. That there are people that are impoverished in those countries as well as here. And we could be putting that money to better use. All we got to do is just legalize that issue, and I think a lot of it will All right, I got to stop you there, okay? Since we only got about 10 more minutes, sure. and it's okay. No, but I appreciate you know your input. It's great. I just want a non-violent yeah. world. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that would be sort of we all we all want a lot of stuff. Um, so we all have a lot left, left time left, because um, we're all going to go out and do our 420 circle. There's about another 10 minutes. We got 10 to 4, so we got a little bit of time. Um, so back to what I was kind of getting on to about uh, where this is going and what it is now. So I talked about the proposed changes and how the privatization, how the government wants to get out. And the government wants to get out because again, like I said, we're going to get legalization for everyone. With the states, what's going on down there, public opinion, you can look up for the last 10 years, every poll done in Canada clearly shows, I mean when they do Canada wide, has always clearly shown over 50%, usually 52%, it's been steady for 10 years now, want to see a change in the laws. Um, leniency, they want workable or sensible drug laws. Things that are enforceable. Laws that people don't want are enforceable. And this is why, clearly an example is how all the people growing weed and using weed and being pretty open about it and acting like it's legal anyways. So that, there's a pretty slack ass, you can pretty much smoke a joint anywhere and not get really hassled as long as you're kind of cool, yeah, whatever. Cop goes by, he might kind of catch the play, but they're not gonna slam on the brakes, holy shit, you know, flights go, no, that doesn't happen. So, you know, you don't have to put the towel under the door in the hotel. It's just like open the window and it'll be okay. Because, you know, it's not that bad. They're not kicking down doors unless you're growing pot, but not for use. Unless somebody's complaining and you're, you know, doing something wrong, really bad. But uh, so they, they're trying to duck it. They've been taken to court too many times. They know where this is going. They don't want to be uh, caught and have to, you know, completely look like fools because they had the opportunity. They were there for, they've had 10 years to make a workable program to, you know, say, gee, okay, you guys are right, we'll just do this. They're just, uh-uh, ain't gonna happen. And that was a liberal government. So, you know, we can't blame the conservatives for that. It's, you know, they, the liberals were just as bad. They had the chance. Nowadays, they talk about, oh, but it's on our new form. We're gonna legalize pot. Until you make that an election issue, I'm not interested because you guys have been in that position more than enough times. They had Kretchen was like made jokes about it. Don't start life through joint yet, uh, you know. And he was, but uh, you got you keep putting your hand up. What I was, I was going to say, are we at this point of trying to sort of make sure there's kind of like a consultation process about what they're going to do next? So well, that we don't they, have to go through another court process. They they put out their they asked for consultations. They all that went out to all the people in the program, and know. then <laughs> that's closed right now. So we're waiting for the next reply from them because I want to see where they with all the stuff that they got. Many people I know who spent thousands and thousands of dollars renovating places to grow pot. They want their money back. I said I want one person I know is out over ten grand, and they got the receipts. And they said, well, I want some. Who's going to pay to put this apartment back into an apartment? They gutted an apartment. They owned an apartment building. They took one of their units and gutted it to make a, a room. Uh, so they're going to want the money for that back. Uh, I know other guys that are designated growers. That act. One guy actually built a place in Port Alberta. It is the size of this room. And he's a DG with five licenses. Well, <coughs> so there's as much licenses. plants as there are seats in that place. Yeah. Like this. It's huge. It's amazing. And he hires people. He's got people working. Um, so they're going to want their money back. Myself, I've been doing this for 12 years legally. 
I'm going to be like, wait a minute, I'm not giving that up. This is part of my therapy. This is my routine. And when they do try to take those away, most people I've talked to who grow now are going to continue and say, send the cops and we'll deal with it then. And I think that's... Just make sure to I think they're going to be, there will be court cases, I think, before that even happens, though, people who are going to be going to court. And uh, but like I say, most people don't have the money to, inst to initiate a case, so they have to do it. They have to wait for the police to arrest them and then go out and start the process. And usually at that point, you'll be able to find, there's lawyers lining up who will want to take those, that case. Sounds like mental abuse against the patients that need it. There's it's just an unwillingness to, to, to admit. Uh, and another part is, by the government going back and actually doing the right thing now, at this point though, it's almost like they have to admit they were wrong. And that's, Something they have a big do, problem yeah. with that. They don't ever admit they were wrong. They don't even like to apologize, never won't admit they were wrong. Because they have to apologize again, is like admitting you were wrong. So they don't, <laughs> it's a big deal. And also they worry about opening up to lawsuits as soon as they start that. They go, oh my God, next thing now someone will sue us. So they're always worried about that. Right um, that I showed now, like, two weeks ago, I was reported that Stephen Harper last year spent $500 million of your money defending himself on legal fees. Just so you know. That's a new record in Canada, by the way. Himself. That's just in, like, in 2011. I was just, that's just one of the little facts. So that's stuff you could find out when you, if you watch my show Mondays at 3 o'clock on Pot TV. Uh, it's www.pot.tv. And I'm on Mondays at 3 Pacific time here. So, uh, but yeah, I'm always pulling up stuff. Like I, I just find stuff out all the time. I'm, I hound that Harper, man. I tell you, I'm always looking for what yeah. he's doing. Because he's just so easy. To, he's so easy to pick apart. Before I, um, does anybody have any other questions? No? No questions? We can go get high? Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. That's McMahon, everybody. Yay. Thanks for coming. Yay. Next week's lecture will be given by my colleague from the Victoria Cannabis Buyers Club, Owen Smith, who uh, recently made a constitutional challenge that was successful in the Supreme Court of British Columbia. So he'll be here to tell you all about the intricacy of that and, and also the general history of the club. That'll be next week at 3 p.m. Thanks for coming.